Ducks fans. Are you ready? You are listening to the Ducks and Pucks podcast with your hosts, Mike Walters and Eddie Jones. This is the number one home for Anaheim Ducks talk and analysis. Here we go. Welcome to the show. This is your host, Mike Walters, along with my co-host, Eddie Jones, and we have a good show for you this week. Uh, not too much happened around the league, uh, uh, you know, concerning the Ducks and whatnot, but, um, you know, we have Max Jones updates and look. Uh, Raquel and Lindholm updates to get to and a couple other uh, news within the organization to talk about and tons of fan questions so we'll get to all those and and hopefully address all the concerns this week Um, but the first uh, thing to get to Eddie really this week was uh, Max Jones he signed his uh, entry-level contract with the Ducks for three years and uh, obviously we're happy to have him yeah you know I think it was a formality that he, you know, he would eventually sign his entry level. You know, most of uh, you've seen a lot of first rounders uh, go out and, and, and sign their entry levels. I, I think the most one of the most recent ones was Logan Brown with with the Ottawa Senators, and you know, usually you see that a lot from the top fifteen guys, and or you, from from at least most of the first rounders too. So, um, it, it's nice to see, and you know, it does I guess open up the possibility for him to make the team out of camp. I know when we talked to him on the podcast, he said, you know, that's obviously his goal. And you would expect that, that he, you know, he'd be focusing on trying to make the NHL uh, right out of camp. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure if he can do it. I, I think he, he definitely has the ability to do it. Um, but do I think he could benefit from uh, another season with the Knights? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think uh, him spending another season in the OHL will, will help his development, but you know, if he if he comes to camp and, and he wows at a camp, then there's a there's a good shot that you know he could he could uh, make a starting roster, especially with you know the the lack of forward depth that we now have up front, and uh, you know the, with him signing a contract, there's that possibility now. Yeah, that was one of the uh, fan questions that we had from uh, uh, Stevie on Twitter that asked us about, you know, whether or not Jones can make the team. Uh, it's kind of, you know, the biggest question I've heard from other people as well is, you know, now that he's signed, is he going to go back to London and play for the Knights? Or is he going to make the jump all the way to the Ducks? And, you know, I think it's a bit of a stretch. Uh, I mean, you can go back and listen to the podcast, as Eddie mentioned, we had a few weeks ago. And, uh you know, uh, Max Jones sounds pretty confident. He's, he wants to try for that left wing spot, obviously, with the Ducks still not getting um, the left wing that they've been trying to during the summertime. But I think it's going to be difficult, Eddie. I, I agree with you. I, I don't think he's quite NHL ready yet. Um, obviously, I'm happy that we got him. And, you know, it's, it's not a knock against him. He's definitely going to be a good player in my mind. But I, I think the Ducks may try something else. And uh, some of the other things that we talked about before is, and this is maybe a stretch too, Eddie, is maybe trying to play seven defensemen like Tampa Bay's been doing. But that's another option the Ducks may have to look at because, they, you know, they haven't gone out and gotten anybody as far as that left wing position that they've wanted. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I mean the, that could be an option. We could end up playing seven defensemen. Um, you know, then with the likely person uh, going down would be uh, Shea Theodore. You'd expect him then to to go and uh, and play with the goals for the majority of the season and, and come up during injuries or or if somebody else isn't playing up to par. Um, and that's something you could see them do. I, I mean, that's not the ideal situation, but if if deals can't be worked out for Fowler or for Dupre or or for you know to or for Stone or either to move them onto a different team, it, it's just something you're gonna have to do. You know the, these guys are all under contract. Uh, you, know, you can't really send them down to the minors without bringing them, you know sending them through waivers. So um, you know it, it kind of blocks the. Uh, I guess it doesn't really block the development of a guy like Shea Theodore. You know he's still gonna develop down in the goals, uh, but I think most of us. Uh, believe that he's ready for for the NHL, so it would be a little bit disappointing to see them play that. But I, uh, you know, it's definitely a possibility. Yeah, I mean, it's either you know they bring up Max Jones, or they try you know seven defensemen, or you know they try for a trade. And we've talked about trades before, and and uh, we had George ask us a question about that, as far as you know who. Who else could the Ducks look at and what else is out there? And, and you know, I really think it's uh, slim pickings, Eddie. Um, you know, I, I heard from the team that the Ducks did try to work out a trade with Detroit and uh, that Tatar was one of the targets that the Ducks were looking at, but it didn't work out. Uh, and, you know, both of us were really big on that, and we had heard it from other places as well. But um, th- that deal isn't going to get done, it looks like. So I don't see a whole lot out there as far as trade options. I, I think maybe New York uh, – 
the Rangers, that is, is probably the you know best team. Uh, maybe Kreider out of there, or maybe some other players. What do you think, Eddie? Yeah, I, you know the the teams have definitely shrunk from the initial list that we had uh, way back right after the draft, and you know with Detroit putting them in in a difficult cap situation, and, and a lot of other teams doing the same thing. You know the the only real you know the partner that seems to to have emerged is the New York Rangers now. Obviously, uh, you know we'll get into it a little bit later. They just signed Brendan Peary. They just signed uh, Jimmy Vesey as well. So they've got a lot of forward depth up front. They've got a couple of prospects who seem to be uh, on the verge of of re- being ready for the NHL. Um, and they're definitely looking for for a top four defenseman. So you know there's a possibility there. Um, you know they've they've had some issues with Girardi and, and Mark Stahl uh, underperforming. You know they're they're two highest paid defensemen. You know, they do also have McDonough and Kevin Klein, so their top four is pretty good. Um, but it definitely couldn't hurt for them to add a guy like Cam Fowler with that four depth now. Um, and you know they're going to be trying to contend for a Stanley Cup this year for sure. So there's a possibility you could see a guy like uh, like Kreider coming back the other way, maybe Zuccarello. You know it, it all depends on on if a deal can be worked out with the Rangers are willing to give up. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, I think New York would be, you know, probably the most likely spot now. I mean, other than that, I mean, you look around and it's just difficult. All these teams we talked about, they're in their cap situations that they're in. They're either close to the cap, they're slightly over to the cap, or or they have a few players left that are going to, you know, basically put them almost maxed out. So there's there's not a lot of options. I, I do agree with you, and I think that, uh, you know, the Rangers are probably the best bet. And, um, it, you know, if the Ducks can't get that done, like we said, we go back, you know, to the other situation. We see what happens with Jones or maybe playing more defensemen. Uh, that's something that the Ducks are going to have to look at doing. But another thing they're going to have to look at doing, and I know this is a broken record, but the Ducks are, you know, trying to, you know, re-sign uh, Lindholm and Raquel. And we had some more news this week. Uh, Cronwall is not going to be in the World Cup of Hockey, so now Lindholm is in. And they're both going to be playing, and the uh, the World Cup starts, you know, September 17th. So we're just a couple weeks away from that, Eddie. But it creates an interesting situation. You're going to have both of these guys playing in that tournament. And both of them still need to get re-signed. And, uh, you know, the Ducks need these guys. And I think some people, you know, at least, the, you know, the way that it went down last week on our podcast, we had some people that weren't really happy with the World Cup, Eddie. And I think part of the fear is, is we have both these players that aren't officially re-signed and the threat of getting an injury for, you know, games that don't matter in terms of the NHL. So uh, it's going to be interesting what happens. I think a lot of us are really going to be watching these games in September and seeing, you know, how these guys do, along with the other Ducks that are in the tournament, Eddie. Yeah, and, and you know we mentioned when Raquel was in there, most of our our core was going to be uh, at the World Cup, and now obviously with Lindholm there, you've you've pretty much solidified that, where you know the majority of of this team is going to be at the World Cup. Um, the possibility of any of them getting injured, um, I, I think is definitely an issue. Um, but it, it will be nice to see you know more Ducks players play in the tournament, uh, see how they do, you know, get them more prepared for the season. Um, you know, it 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 does present an issue that if they don't have a contract signed going into the tournament um you mentioned uh, last week that you know if they have great tournaments uh, they could up their value or if they have a bad tournament or whatever it could it could bring their value down i don't think it will affect it too much um but you know there's always the worry of injury especially with you know this many players playing in the tournament playing this early uh, into the season you know any injury is is multiplied when you're playing that close to, to the season yeah, I agree. And I, and I think where the nervousness comes in, too, is you have this tournament, you know, that's going up to, you know, uh, October 1st here. Um, and it's so close to the season. I think that's what's worrying a lot of the fans now, because here we are at the very end of August, you know, turning into the beginning of September and they're both not resigned. And, uh, you know, one of the fans, uh, Darren, asked, you know, what's taking so long with both these deals? And I, I can tell you that the Lindholm deal, um, you know, a lot of it, and we've talked about this before, it revolves around Lemieux being his agent and the expectations um, that he has. And, you know, if we look at some of the players that have been re-signed, or, you know, for similar age and position and whatnot, a, a good comparable one is Seth Jones, and, and his contract is 5.4 each year. So, you know, the, they may be looking at something like that, Eddie. And, you know, I don't know if Murray is maybe a little bit less than that. But, you know, that seems to be the problem I see, at least with with the Lindholm situation. Is I don't know if the years are so much an issue, but I definitely think that, you know, the amount per year is a big deal here. Yeah, and, you know, you, you can look at some of the comparables. Obviously, you know, Seth Jones has to be the 
the best comparison. Uh, you know, they're, they're similar ty- types of players. They're not strictly offensive defense and mostly two way guys. You know, they both, they both put up around, you know, 20 to 30 points in the, in the NHL. Um, Seth Jones, uh, drafted fourth overall in 2013. Lindholm drafted sixth overall in 2012. So the, the comparisons are there for sure. Um, you know, we've mentioned multiple times that we, we'd expect Lindholm to get anything from five to six, um, anything over six, I think would be too much. You look at some of the defensemen in that range and, you know, you're getting to the, the top end, uh, elite defenseman in the NHL. So, um, you know, if that's what they're asking for, uh, that could be why it's taking so long. I think, uh, you know, the, the comparisons are there in contracts. You look at Tory Krug as well, uh, Brody in, in Calgary, you know, they're more offensive defensemen, but they're still looking at getting around five and 5.5, around 5 million. So I think that's where it should land. Um, you know, if it does, it all depends on, uh, you know, Bob Murray and, and the, the, the agent and Lemieux and, and Lindholm himself. And, you know, um, I think that's where we we would all expect it to land, but the fact that it's taking so long definitely isn't isn't a good sign. Yeah, and I and I think you know the word is too, uh, you know, from the organization is that it seems like Raquel might be the one that's going to be re-signed before Lindholm, uh, obviously because his deal isn't going to be worth as much as uh, Lindholm. It's going to be up there, but also he, you know, I'm not sure who his agent is, but it's not Lemieux. I know that so. I know that's uh, helping out a little bit. So that's what I would kind of expect here in the next couple of weeks, Eddie, is I think we'll hopefully see Raquel get resigned. But uh, after that, as far as Lindholm, you know, it's just uh, it's still up in the air. And, and the World Cup kind of puts a wrench into some of those things because, you know, they're going to be going and playing and doing that and then coming back right before the season. So it's going to be a tight schedule for both of those guys. Yeah, and, you know, if you would have told me way back uh, at the end of the season that it would be Raquel who would be signed before Lindholm, I would have been surprised. You know, the Lindholm contract has always seemed, uh, you know, it seemed like the easier one to, to predict the value. You know, you can look at similarities across the league and say, you know, the similar play to this guy, points, totals, age, and, and you would say, okay, he's going to make between 5 and $6 million, and you just kind of got to work down from there, and it, and it narrows it down. Um, and with Raquel, it's always seemed like, well, you know, what is he, what is he worth right now? You know, he put up 31 points uh, in 2014, 2015. He improved to 43 uh, last year, and he's only really had those two seasons in the NHL so far. Um, and you know, for him, you've got to decide between a bridge deal or a longer term deal. And I always thought, you know, that would be the the harder contract. But you know, if uh, if you can get him signed and then just focus on Lindholm, I think it'll move things along a little bit faster. But you know, it definitely throws a wrench into things with the World Cup and now now both of them attending it. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, maybe the bridge deal route with Raquel would be the easier thing to do because as we talked about last week, you know, the uh, the cap uh, for the Ducks looked to be around $7.5 million according to Cap Friendly. So if the Ducks are able to get him at a bridge deal, uh, you know, then there's a better chance of maybe giving uh, Lindholm a little bit more that, uh, you know, Lemieux maybe wants or whatnot. So... That's where we're at right now. Uh, obviously, not much of an update other than, you know, they're both going to be in the World Cup, and, and we do think that Raquel is going to be signed sooner. So that's where it stands as of this uh, past weekend. Uh, hopefully we'll find something out in a couple couple coming up weeks here. Um, some other, uh, you know, news going on too with the Ducks is uh, we can expect Richie to be up with the team, and we had Garrett ask us a question, uh, you know, about how he would do um, with the Ducks next season. Obviously, without the the winger that they've gotten signed, you would think Richie would get a lot more playing time. And uh, Garrett wonders if he could maybe score 15 or 20 goals, uh, you know, for the Ducks next season. And you know, I don't know. I that's a tough one. I mean, I would like for him to do that, but. I think it really depends on what lines he plays on, Eddie. Uh, if the Ducks don't go out and get that winger, we could see him with uh, you know Perry and Gets off on the one line, or or maybe we see him on the Raquel line um, with Raymond and and see how he works out on that line. I, I think he would kind of maybe go back and forth between those two lines and and go from there, Eddie. Yeah, and it really all depends too on how much he's worked on his individual game. Uh, you know, during the off season, we've seen him score goals at every level. You know, he's he scored goals in the OHL. He put up 16 goals uh, in 38 games with the goals last year, so he can score at the AHL level. And now he's just got to adapt it and, and bring it to the NHL level. And I think if he if he can work on that, and like you said, if he can play on on a line with a creative center, you know, either Raquel or 
or even Kessler or, or Getzlaff, if he can play in a line with, with some, some better players. I think he could definitely put up 15 to 20 goals if he, if he can play a full season. I think he has the ability, and I, I just think it, you know, it's, it's all up to how he's adapted his game and, and you know, how he's worked in the offseason to, to get where, to where he wants to be. You know, he's got a great shot, and uh, you know, I, I definitely think he could reach it, but you know, from scoring two goals in 33 games last year, it would definitely be a, a huge step up if he was to you know, hit uh, 15 or 20. You know, and another factor that, that goes into Richie uh, and his performance, and you know some of the other guys too, is uh, now that Randy Carlisle's here. And we had another question about him as well for Mario. Mario asks, you know, is, is the forecheck going to be the old dump and chase, or is he going to try and you know, do the more modern puck possession type game? And we don't really have an answer on that. I mean, we know that from before he's done the dump and chase game. Obviously, with Anaheim, he did that. We saw it at Toronto, too. He's also said in the you know the press conference when he got hired that he's learned new things and he's not going back to the similar type stuff. So I would really hope he doesn't because if we want certain players to progress and do well, like Richie, um, you know, we brought in Raymond as well. We got Verment now, too. These other guys that, you know, we don't really know how these kind of guys are going to do, Eddie. These are the kind of guys that they could score five goals each next year or they could bust out maybe 20 each. I mean, we, we don't know. It, it, that's what kind of makes the season – I guess it's nerve wracking for some of you fans out there because we're getting certain guys and it's unknown how these guys are going to do. And it's unknown how the Ducks four check is going to be. But if Carlisle goes more of the puck possession route and goes more with the schemes that the Ducks did last year, then I am kind of excited for the season. And I do think that these guys will have a chance. And maybe if they bring up some other goals players, which we talked about in some of the other podcasts too, Eddie, I think some of these wingers are going to have some opportunities. And, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we do go that way on the forecheck that some of these guys could, you know, drop 20 goals this coming season. Yeah, you know, I could definitely see it happening. And and I think, you know, it's going to be a mix of the old and new Carlisle. I, I, you know, I, I don't think any coach ever loses – you know the, their whole style and the way that they play hockey but you know he's as he's mentioned he's he's been watching the ducks games he's been in anaheim he's he's adapted as a coach you know he he's moved along with the times in, in coaching and I, and i think he'll have a you know we'll see a different carlo than we saw when he was here last time i think it it's just how the games change and, and you know how you have to adapt to be a coach in the nhl and i'm sure they wouldn't have hired him if they thought he was just going to come in and coach exactly the same as he did before and I think it'll, it'll be beneficial to some of these players. You know, it all depends on how they fit the style, how they, you know, how they line up the team. And, you know, I, I think there's a definite possibility, maybe a guy like Richie or, like you said, maybe Vermette or even Mason Raymond, if they, you know, get off to a good start and, and, and you know, fit a style and gel with their line mates. I definitely think they could, you know, if playing a full healthy season, could put up, uh, you know, 15 to 20 goals. And that's what we're going to have to hope. I mean, even even if the Ducks go get another winger, I mean, some of these guys are going to have to come up because, as we said, there's not a lot of options out there. So it doesn't look like, you know, the Ducks are going to get, you know, too many more additions. If they do, it's going to be maybe one through a trade. And we'll talk about some of the other people that, that basically went off the board and, and some movement that happened uh, this last uh, week and a half. We'll get to it towards the end. But, yeah, that's what they're going to have to look at. And um, it kind of leads, you know, some people to – put some more heat on Murray uh, as far as what's going on and what they're going to try and do. And we had Alexander ask, you know, uh, does Murray have any aces up his sleeve? What, you know, what is his plan? What is he going to try and do? Um, I, I do know that the ducks are still trying to make a trade and that they're still trying to go get that left winger. I don't know if there's any aces up his sleeve per se, but he's trying to do that move for a defenseman. I mean, he's got plenty. You know, we've talked about it. you got eight or nine guys. Uh, you know, if you throw Montour in there, too, I mean, you really have ten. I mean, you know, there's a lot. And there's other guys coming up, too, that are doing well um, in the system. So that's still the, the format. It's still, okay, which defenseman can we send out and try and get that forward in? But like you and I said, Eddie, it's just tough. And Murray's in a really tough spot. I mean, the cap's smaller now. Obviously, the Ducks are spending more up to the cap, which is good because they need to do that to keep Lindholm and Raquel. Uh, but it, it's going to be tough. I, you know, I don't know if the Ducks will make another move b- before the season starts, Eddie. I, I just it looks really tough right now as far as trying to make a trade. Yeah, and you know, like you said, I don't think he has an, an ace up his sleeve. I think, um, you know, if any deal were close, it would have been materialized by now. Like we mentioned, there's not a lot of teams from looking, you know, from the outside that would 
benefit or would be able to make a deal for, for say, a player like Fowler or even to bring on a guy like Depray or Stoner with the contracts that they have, you know, if you're looking to move Stoner or Dupre, you would expect to, to, to move to a team. You know, every team looks to be above the cap floor, but you would expect to move it to a team who uh, who needs to fill a roster a spot and can take on some cap. But anytime you do that, you're usually losing in the trade just to win some cap space. Uh, so you would end up having to ship out a little bit more to, to gain that cap space than you may like. Um, and, and any trade for Fowler right now is just difficult at this point in the season. Um, and, and, you know, trying to get in that, that top line left winger, like we mentioned that, you know, the, the real good option right now is the Rangers with the, the two signings that they've made recently. Um, you know, the Leafs are still there with James Van, James Van, sorry, James Van Riemsdyk, but you would have expected that, um, if anything to, to have happened already with the amount of times, uh, Murray and, and Lou Lamorello have talked this off season, you know, involving Freddie Anderson and, and Jonathan Bernier and, and the trades that were made there. Um, and then possibly the the Tampa Bay Lightning too with, with Andre Pilat, you know they've got to resign uh, Nikita Kucherov and Hedman's contract kicks in next year, so there's a possibility of something being made there. Um, but if it gets made uh, before the season, that's hard to say. You know the, these are deals that could also happen, you know during the season or at the trade deadline as well. Yeah, and, and you know part of the problem, you know, going around the league too is the expansion draft, Eddie. I mean, a lot of teams are trying to sign those players like we talked about in order to meet, you know, option A or option B. You've got to have a certain amount of players signed through 2017, 2018. And, you know, that, that's why we didn't see as much trading at the trade deadline. You know, you saw massive signings. You saw you saw um, um, uh, a lot of uh, free agents signed during that deadline um, in the summer, but then you didn't see a lot of trades. You only saw a handful of trades. So it, it's going to be tough. And I do know one one small update. I know that uh, Bieksa is going to waive his no-movement clause for purposes of that expansion draft. So that's going to help out as far as the Ducks protecting you know, uh, the seven wingers is what we pretty much think they're going to do. They're probably going to expose Vermette and Bull and then protect all the rest that they can. Uh, so that'll help a little bit, but it still would be nice that if we, we had that one more forward to you know add into the mix and um, you know just to make sure that the offense is more balanced. Yeah, you know, for sure. And and that's gonna help a lot. Um, you know, we've the the way we've been looking at it so far is yeah, they would protect Vaughn and Lindholm and, and then probably Manson, but the fact is now if Fowler stays, you would protect uh Vaughn, Fowler and Lindholm and then expose Manson and then obviously Bexa and, and Dupre and Stoner and uh and then on forward you would expect them to obviously protect the core, you know. Gaslav and Perry and Kessler are already protected. Cogliano as well. You'd expect them to go and protect Silverberg and Raquel. And then, um, you know, if they don't bring in another forward, you know, possibly Wagner or Nason or, or you know, somebody else they decide to protect. And, you know, it, it's good to have that flexibility. Um, you know, it would be nice to see them bring in another forward and then be able to, you know, at least they have that spot to be able to protect them. I, you know, I'm not think I don't think they're too worried about exposing a, a guy like Wagner or a guy like Nason. Or even a guy like Manson, it it would be hard to see him go, and and he would probably be the guy that a team targets. But you know, it it would be better to to lose a guy like him uh, for nothing than to lose a guy like Fowler for nothing. Yeah, I totally agree, and I and I think that's where they're at right now. Um, unless obviously something changes, and, and you know, and there's still a ways away. I mean, obviously, we have another season to go, and and things can happen. You know, there can be trades and injuries and whatnot. But as of right now, I agree with you. I think that's where they're at. And, you know, it kind of brings us to another uh, fan question uh, from Alex. He asks about the Pacific Division and how we think it would pan out, at least right now. Uh, like we said, things can change and whatnot. But I think if we look at it now, it's still a little bit early. But I, I always like to, you know, kind of look at these things. And, and as the season gets closer, usually Eddie and I will talk about the whole league and, and what we think as far as how teams will do. But we can kind of look at the Pacific now. And, you know, if I look at these teams, Eddie, I kind of break it down into two groups and, and maybe it's the Cali bias and me, but and, uh, you know, it's really just the way the teams look. I, I really think next year, uh, San Jose is still going to do very well in the Pacific. I think LA is going to be up there as well. And the ducks are going to be up there too. Don't forget. Uh, you know, we talked about whether or not they're a cup contending team and we can debate that left and right, but I think they're still going to be a good team next year. So I, I see those three as being, you know, the ones that are probably going to be one through three in some kind of order. Maybe one of them will slip down to four. But, you know, I see them being in the top. And as far as the other teams go, I, I see Arizona, Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton being in the other side of the division. 
Um, I just don't see those teams doing as much. You know, Vancouver's trying to rebuild. Arizona's been rebuilding, but they've been doing better. Um, Calgary and Edmonton have been kind of stepping it up a little bit too. Maybe one of those may sneak in there in the wild card spot or whatnot. But that's kind of how I see it. I, I really see it as the California teams and then Arizona and the, and the Canadian teams, you know, kind of two groups in the division. Yeah, you know, I, I think – the team that would that has the best shot at winning it, I think it has to be San Jose. I think you know they'll build on their their Stanley Cup final run, um, you know from last year. You know they added uh, Mikhail Bodker, um, they got the the core of their players back. They they still have Joel Ward. They they've got Thomas Hurdle resigned. You know Burns is still there. Martin is still there. Vlasic, Braun, uh, Martin Jones, who had a great season last year, is there. So I think they have to be the favorites for the Pacific. Um, I think LA got worse. You know, they did lose Lucic. They didn't really bring anybody to replace him. You know, they brought in Teddy Purcell, but it, it's not an ideal replacement for for a guy like Lucic. Um, you know, they, obviously they've got Doughty still back there with Martinez and Muzzin and and, and Jonathan Quick and goal. So I think they'll still have a good shot. And you know, the them and, and the Ducks, I think, will be fighting it out for second and third. Um, but there is a good chance that Edmonton does surprise a lot of people. Obviously, losing Taylor Hall is going to hurt. Um, but I think it actually makes them better because I think Adam Larson is the guy they've been looking for. Um, and then pairing him with Clefbaum and Sakara and, and Fane and, and Darnell Nurse, who should take a step up this season. I think their defense has got a, a lot better uh, with that trade. And then obviously a full season of Connor McDavid is going to help them out, bringing in Milan Lucic and, and then possibly seeing a guy like Jesse Pugliarvi uh, play a part for them this season as well um, is going to be big. So they could surprise a lot of people and jump up and challenge Anaheim in, in L.A. for that uh, second and third spot. If if they can get going and get some consistent goaltending and some strong defensive play, there's a chance there. And, you know, Calgary is still a good team as well. I mean, they brought in Brian Elliott. They finally solidified their goaltending situation. They actually have two new goalies now. They've got Brian Elliott and Chad Johnson. So no more Kari Ramo, no more Jonas Hiller. They've seemed to solidify their goalie situation at least for um, this upcoming season. You know the defense core there is still is still there for them. They added uh, Troy Brower up front, re-signed uh, Sean Monahan, and I'm sure they'll get uh, Johnny Goodrow uh, re-signed for the next season. So there's always a threat there with with them. Um, but you know I think it is those five teams. Um, you know I don't think Arizona's good enough yet. Um, they've made a lot of good moves for the future, but right now they're not a good enough team. I think they'll probably finish second bottom. And then the, the Vancouver and the Canucks who are seem to be in an internal struggle if they're rebuilding or not. Um, you know, they, they've signed a couple players. They let Verbata go. Um, but it, it looks to be that they'll be the team that will finish in the bottom. I, I you know the Sedins could come out and have a, a, a strong season, but you know, every, every year they're getting older. Um, the style that, that, that they play, um, no, I, I just don't see them finishing higher or even challenging for a playoff spot. You know, they might be a little bit higher than, than the bottom of the Pacific, but I think, you know, it's going to be either them or Arizona who will finish bottom. Yeah, and I, I agree with you on all the fronts on that. I, I think that's, you know, how it's going to shape up, at least now, unless, you know, obviously something happens in the next uh, couple of months here before the season gets going. And, you know, speaking of that, I mean, it seemed like last week there wasn't too much going on with the season coming up, but, you know, a lot of stuff actually did happen in this past week. There were some signings. There was even a trade that happened. You know, like we said, there weren't too many trades. Um, once the free agency hit in July, you know, we, we thought there might be more, but, um, there were some things that were going on. Um, one of them is, uh, you know, as you mentioned, uh, Brandon Paris, he got signed by, uh, the New York Rangers. So he ended up going there for a one year deal. And, uh, I know some of the fans are upset about this, Eddie, but, uh, you know, I wasn't really too upset. I mean, some of the things that the ducks didn't really like were his style of play and his forecheck wasn't really that great. And, and I know, you know, we don't have a winger now. So you're like, well, someone's better than nothing. So I totally get that, but uh, I'm not really too upset. You know, he went to the Eastern conference and, and New York for one year. So good for him. And, you know, hopefully he does well over there and maybe it helps like, like we talked about, we get a trade out of it somehow. Yeah. You know, I, I think he fits the Eastern conference. I, I think he'll do well going and playing with the Rangers. You know, he obviously did well in Florida. Um, I just don't think he's physical enough to play in the Western Conference and specifically to play with, you know, a team like the Ducks who, who are playing, you know, play a physical style. I think, you know, maybe he'd fit a Colorado Avalanche or, or a quicker team like that. But, you know, I'm, I'm not too disappointed we didn't bring him back. I, I would have liked, you know, for, for at the price um, and with bringing in nobody, I think it would have been an all right signing. But, 
you know, like I said, I, I think he, he more fits the, the uh, Eastern Conference. So, it, it, you know, it's nice to see him go somewhere. Um, and, you know, it, it presents a possibility for us now, we're, we're, like we talked about with uh, the depth that the Rangers have now after signing him and Vesey, there's a potential trade uh, option there for Fowler. Yeah, and what what did you think about Vesey? You know, it was like uh, it was like the Vesey sweepstakes there for a little while. Everybody was really big on this guy, and you know, some people had thought, oh, maybe the you know in West Coast. But you and I talked about it. We we thought more of an East Coast type thing. Some people in Boston thought obviously he would go that route, and he he didn't. He ended up going to New York, and I know Bolesky and a few people weren't too happy about that. But what did you think? You know, he ended up going to New York, and and, and again, maybe another thing that could help the Ducks facilitate a trade. Yeah, I'm not surprised he he stayed out east, um, but it, it it you know I I don't really like this whole situation. We see it a lot with with lately with the college free agents, and we saw it obviously in, in you know closer to home with, with Justin Schultz when he left for uh, Edmonton. You know he got drafted by Nashville, didn't sign there, got traded to Buffalo, and then didn't sign there either. Waited till free agency and then signed with the Rangers. You know I'm not a huge fan of the whole situation. Um, I think he'll be a good player. I think the the hype, at least for now, is a is a li- he's a little bit overhyped. I think a lot of people, you know, were taking advantage of the fact that nothing was going on. I think he's a good prospect. You know, I don't think he's really even in the top twenty of, of NHL prospects right now. Um, he should be able to fit in on the Rangers probably third or fourth line this season. Um, and he will be a good player, that's for sure. Um, and and it presents a you know a situation for them. Um, that they're going to have to move a couple guys around because he should make the lineup. Uh, I, I don't think they'll play him in, in the AHL this season unless he struggles. Um, but, yeah, like I said, you know, um, Bolesky obviously wasn't happy that he didn't sign yeah. in Boston. And, yeah. You know, a lot of Toronto fans were, were unhappy that he didn't sign uh, here in, Tro- in Toronto. But, um, you know, I think if, if you wanted the best chance to win, going to the Rangers right now is probably is probably it. So. Yeah, I mean, I thought he would go East Coast. I didn't know which team, but I figured he would stay out that direction. So good for him. And, you know, like I said, I, I, I hope it works out somehow for us that we can make some kind of a deal and get something done. But if not, then it is what it is. And, uh, you know, the other the other deal I wanted to get done, and you and I talked about this and, and didn't happen, is uh, Yuri Hoodler. And he ends up going to Dallas for one year, $2 million. And when I saw that, I'm not going to lie. I was kind of upset. I, I mean, I'm like $2 million for that guy. I really wish the Ducks would have got Hoodler. I, I mean, one year, $2 million wouldn't have been a bad deal. I mean, I, I, maybe Murray wants someone a little bit longer, uh, you know, and for that left-wing spot. But, I mean, again, going back to, you know, what what's better than nothing, you know, I, I really would have liked the Ducks to have brought him on maybe for a one- or two-year deal at, at $2 million each year, Eddie. I, I think it could have really helped us out. Yeah, and, you know, I'm sure they discussed it, but, you know, like we've mentioned, with everything kind of relying on and on something else happening, it, it's difficult. And obviously, you know, from what you've mentioned and what you've heard, um, the trades aren't easy to make right now. Freeing up cap space is going to be a difficult situation. So, you know, if you bring in Hoodler for $2 million and then you bank on yourself maybe being able to make a trade and then it doesn't happen, well, then you can't sign Raquel or Lindholm. You know, it's not a possibility. So um, I think in that aspect, it's good that they didn't make a trade. You know, it would have put them in a difficult situation. Or sorry, that they didn't sign Hoodler. It would have put them in a difficult situation to make a trade, to be able to sign players. And, you know, that's the, the situation they're in right now and, and how difficult of a one it is. You know, everything relies on, on everything else. So, you know, possibly signing him could have hurt you and, and bringing one of those guys back so you know in, in that point i'm not disappointed but you know he would have definitely been a good addition to put in the ducks top six yeah and i agree with you i mean looking at the overall picture i mean obviously if they go to make a trade like you said after they had signed hoodler and then there's the cap space gets all screwed up and and we aren't able to sign raquel or lindholm as a result of that of course not i would not want him to be brought in it's just frustrating to see him go so cheap and stay in our conference and dallas too i mean he's not in the pacific but you know still in the conference so a little annoying but uh, like you said i mean we got to get these other deals done so it is what it is um and another signing that came up too recently and and this is one that you and i kind of talked about we had it nailed down 
was uh, Enroth. He ended up going to Toronto, which wasn't really a big surprise. We had heard before Bernier came to the Ducks that he was uh, looking at the Ducks and San Jose. And then obviously once the Bernier deal went down, then it was between San Jose and Toronto. So not too much of a surprise there, Eddie. Obviously they had to backfill once uh, Bernier came to Anaheim. Yeah, it was one of the the only teams who really needed a, an NHL-ready backup uh to, to sit behind uh, obviously Anderson now so I I don't think it's a big surprise uh, you know maybe it taking this long a little bit but you know it's good for him uh, he'll be a good backup for Freddie in, in Toronto and you know he just got uh, named to the World Cup of Hockey as well with uh, Robin Lehner going out so pretty good a pretty good week for, for Jonas and Ross. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. And, uh, you know, one more uh, uh, update. Uh, we have a Wisniewski sighting. Um, he's actually going to go try out uh, Tampa Bay. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, how that pans out. I mean, and, and that's another situation that maybe, uh, I don't know if it would help us out, but, it, you know, it would it'd be something where Tampa Bay may have to adjust some of their signings and do some of their things, Eddie. So it, it may or may not indirectly uh, affect the Ducks. Yeah, and I think it, you know they've been looking for a, you know a spare defenseman for a while, and I you know I think uh, you know they believe that Wisniewski can still play. Um, you know he's, he's had a little bit of struggle since he since he left uh, Columbus, and you know he obviously came to us and, and didn't play much and had some struggles there, and you know had some struggles in Carolina too. So it'd be nice to see him, you know, at least get a tryout and, and possibly. Uh, you know, make the roster there, and I think if if he can play and get back to to his you know his hockey, I think uh, he'll be a good addition for Tampa Bay. Obviously, it's just a tryout, so nothing's confirmed right now. But you know, it, it's good for him to to get that opportunity. And I think if he ends up making the roster, he'll be a big benefit to their lineup. Yeah, I agree, and I you know I wish him the best. I mean, after last season and all that Carolina and getting hurt, you know, and the what however what it was like five seconds. I mean, it was ridiculous. I felt bad for the guy. And obviously, I know some of the other fans wanted him to stay here as well. So we wish him the best. Uh, you know, like I said, one trade did happen too, Eddie. This was kind of an interesting one. You had Arizona and Florida. Uh, Arizona picking up Boland and Kraus and then sending some picks to Florida. But what did you think about this one? I thought it was kind of interesting. I mean, it's going to kind of help Arizona, and, you know, and obviously them trying to get, you know, better in the Pacific Division. So I think it's going to work out for them. And they only really gave up, a, you know, a couple picks. Yeah, and, and really, this is a continuing on a really good off season and really good beginning for John Chaika in Arizona. I mean, he's making a name for himself this off season. He's taken on Prongress contract. He's taken on Datsuk's contract. Now he's taken on David Boland's contract, and you know he mm-hmm. brought back a really, really good prospect from Florida. Uh, in the meantime, for only a couple picks, um, I know the third round pick is conditional. I think on the fact if. Kraus does play with Arizona, or if they trade him, I think it moves uh, to a second round pick for for the Florida Panthers. And you know, it also is a you know as much as it's a good move for Arizona, it is a good move for Florida too. It does free up about five million dollars in cap space for them. It frees them up from uh, that uh, terrible David Bowling contract, and you know they they they're free to make some moves. Obviously, there's not a lot of free agents left to sign, but uh, you know it gives them some flexibility in having to re-sign some other guys. Probably you know they did lock down. Barkov and Ekblad, so there's no issue there. But you know, it gives them some needed flexibility, and you know, they're in a win now mentality. So I, I wouldn't be surprised to see another move from them. Um, and it really adds to to the depth and, and uh, that Florida has built up. Uh, sorry, not that Arizona has built up in their prospects. So you know, I think it's a real good move for both of them, and, and you know, it's going to pay off in the end for both teams. Yeah, I agree. And you know. Uh... We'll get to the Eastern Conference and all that stuff and looking at the standings, you know, uh, probably in a couple more weeks when we get closer to the season. But I'd keep my eye on Florida. I mean, yeah, they went out early in the playoffs last year, but, you know, they had a great regular season. So that's a you know a team to watch. Um, you know, going back to the Western Conference and some other teams to watch, uh, we have Colorado. They ended up finally uh, replacing Patrick Waugh, Eddie, uh, with Jared Bednar. Um, you know, their uh, minor league uh, affiliate coach. So I think this is a good move. Uh, I think he's going to help out and maybe bring some more stability to the Colorado team. What do you think, Eddie? Yeah, so uh, Bednar coached Lake Erie last year, which was the minor league affiliate of the, the Columbus Blue Jackets, ended up winning a Calder Cup last year. So, um, you know, I, it's actually a guy that when the Ducks were looking for, for a coach, I didn't hear his name come up at all, which was, you know, surprising. Uh, you know, a coach who did win the Calder Cup, but. You know, obviously we see it here with Colorado, and 
you know, I think it, it's good for them to get this done right away. You know, obviously it was, it was a surprise for a lot of people to, to, to see Wall leave uh, the team. I'm not sure how long they knew about it from behind the scenes, but to be able to replace him, replace him in, in about less than a week, I think it's good for them get you know get everything solidified before the start of September and, and have a head coach uh, behind the bench. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I don't know how well he, he'll do. I don't know a ton about him, obviously, other than the fact that they, you know, he won the Calder Cup last year. Um, you know, they had a pretty good run and everything. So I, you know, I, it'll be nice to see a new a new face behind the bench and it'll be cool to see how he does with, with such a young team in Colorado. Yeah, it'll be interesting to watch Colorado and see how they do, uh, especially with the new coach. I think a little bit more stability. So I think it's going to work out. I think it'll be good for the Avalanche. And, you know, another team in the division that had some news, too, this week was the uh, St. Louis Blues. As you know, Bacchus left the team, and now Petrangelo is the uh, captain for the team. So I think that was a good move, too, for uh, St. Louis. I think, you know, he's a quality player, and he's definitely a leader, and uh, I think he's going to help St. Louis this season, too, Eddie. Yeah, and, you know, he's the real anchor on their blue line. So, uh, you know, I don't think there was any surprise that he, you know, he would be named the the new captain, obviously, with Bacchus going to to Boston um, in free agency. So, I think it was just a formality there. You know, he wore the A last year, so um, it, you know, it's a matter of time before you know he stepped up into the captaincy anyway. Even if Bacchus was still there, you know, Bacchus was getting towards the end of his career now, so I think it's a good move for them. He's a young guy. Um, you know, he obviously has leadership qualities, and uh, you know, he's going to be with Team Canada this year too. So I think it's a good move for them, and a, you know, a good fit for the franchise. Yeah, that's that's really it, I guess, this week. Uh, you know, we kind of had more stuff to uh, talk about as far as around the league, which was a good thing. So we'll see what happens next week as far as any other action uh, you know, around the league. I, I don't really think there's going to be too much more, Eddie, until the World Cup. I don't see a lot of signings or trades coming up. But uh, this week was a little busy, so at least we had some updates we could get you you know, around the NHL. And uh, we have one more update with the Ducks, kind of a minor update, but uh, you know, it's, this is important, but uh, I don't know how many of you know uh, Matt Savant, but he worked for the Ducks under fan development. And he actually worked with us, and, and you know, we'd help promote different events uh, through the Ducks. And uh, he actually ended up taking a position as the president of business operations in San Diego with the goals. So I'm happy for him, Eddie. Um, you know, we've talked to him before, uh, maybe I'll try and get him on the show, but, uh, you know, he's really helped us as far as promoting events and talking about different things with the ducks and whatnot. And just, you know, good guy. and glad to see him, uh, get that assignment for himself. Yeah. you know, a, a big promotion. It'll be uh, cool for him to work with the goals and, and run everything there and, you know, trying to uh, expand their presence in the community. And I'm sure he'll do a good job, obviously, you know, it, and how much he's helped out here and, and you know how much we've worked together with him. So it'll be cool to, to see what he can do with, with the goals this season. And uh, one other event uh, happened this week uh, was the Getzloff Shootout Golf Tournament that uh, I was able to go to again, fortunately. Uh, if you haven't heard about it, it's um, it put on by CureDeshane.org, which basically they help uh, – mainly children, but anybody with muscular dystrophy. So it's a really good event. Uh, Temu was there again. Getzloff was there. Cogliano was there. Uh, I posted a couple of photos up so you guys can see them and whatnot. But it was a little bit different this year. Uh, obviously, some of the guys weren't there. Raquel and Lindholm weren't there because of the World Cup and whatnot. But it was a fun event. Um, it helps make awareness. If you want to donate, you can go on the website and check it out. Um, I'm very fortunate. One of my friends, Eric, he, uh, runs a company called entertainment concepts and he helps sponsor a hole. And I, and basically help him. We go work one of the, uh, 18 holes out there and hang out. And, um, it's a good time. And if you ever need anybody to, uh, do a party for you or whatnot, I would check out Eric's company, uh, entertainment concepts. It's uh, E N T C O N dot net. And, uh, he does really good stuff. Uh, helps out. And we also shared uh, the hole with the violent gentleman too, Eddie, which that was good too. Um, you know, talked to those guys for a little while and had a good time. So it was good to work with them and, and, you know, obviously make some more connections with them as we do with other people out there in the community and just trying to build up everything, uh, you know, with ducks and pucks related and, and do stuff to help out people as well. And uh, those are some of the events. I think we're pretty much done for the summer. We had the Fedoran cup and we had that. So with that, we're just, Gonna wait for the World Cup, Eddie. That's the biggest uh, thing coming up here, and hopefully, some kind of a signing with the Ducks. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, it'll be nice to get hockey back with the World Cup, obviously. But you know, I think the big news what we see, you know, pretty much every time the Ducks post anything on on social media, everybody wants them to to get on their case about signing uh, the signing Raquel or signing Lindholm. I kind of feel bad for the social media guy a little bit. Uh, he's got to <laughs> deal with that pretty much every post. But you know, it really is what everybody's waiting for right now. 
um, you know, it, it's it's kind of disappointing to have to wait, you know, this long into August and almost into September. Now, I, you know, I think we all would have expected uh, the deal to be done. Obviously, you know, these are difficult deals. They're young players, and and you know, trying to get these worked out so it works for the team and for the player is difficult. But you know, we would all hope that by the next time we come on the podcast, that something would be done. But you know, you never know right now. And um, and right now, I'm just hoping it gets done before the start of the season. Yeah, exactly. And that's where we're at. And I know it's not the answer everybody wants to hear, but I'm really hoping in the next one or two shows we'll be able to talk about their, you know, them being re-signed and, and going forward. So, but, you know, keep the faith. Uh, the team's still going to be good. They're still going to have a decent season. And uh, we'll keep providing the updates on, you know, weekly or every other week uh, basis. And uh, we'll have some ticket giveaways, too, coming up. We'll be doing the contests on the show. Uh, maybe in the next podcast or the one after that, but we'll be giving away some tickets for uh, opening night uh, on here. We'll also be doing it through uh, some of our other social media stuff as well. So listen for that, and uh, let's go Ducks. See you in a week.